Okay, what would you like me to say? Say who you are um, and why you're on this call. So I'm Joel Denhan. I uh, have been working for the past five years uh, in my own consulting practice with a number of associates, uh, working with uh, mission development, capital planning, um, I suppose you might even call it legal issues uh, for congregations, both within and outside the United Church of Canada. Great, thank you. Paul, could you introduce yourself next? I'm the uh, founder and executive director of the Hero Work Society. We do what are in essence uh, modern day barn raisings, where we uh, mobilize the community to come together hundreds of people, dozens and dozens of companies to renovate um, charity buildings in a really short period of time. So uh, we'll do a three month build in three weekends. It uh, takes uh, months to prepare and uh, gets pulled off very quickly. Um, we've done uh, several um, United Church uh, facilities, one of them being the Esquimalt United Church, which is sort of a community hub here. and. Uh, $100,000 dock refresh for um, Camp Pringle, um, which is part of um, the, uh, the, uh, the network as well. Right. So is that your connection with the United Church as you've done some projects um, for the... Uh, through, uh, through Carla and um, Edge, uh, we've um, entered into a partnership where they're supporting um, us in terms of what it is that we're looking to achieve, which is a we'll call a charitable social franchise model that we can export and, um, and have other communities do what it is that we do. As, as so many people know, uh, charitable infrastructure, whether those are spiritual or housing or a food bank, um, are in terrible condition across the country. And uh, most don't have the capacity or the knowledge to repair those. They, they get a one-to-one -one return on investment ratio, i.e. you need a $100,000 renovation, you raise $100,000 and you get it done. Um, where we... Um, uh, have a four to one or a three to one return on investment. So the, uh, the recipient um, provides, let's say 25% of the costs and, and we mobilize the community to provide the rest of it. Um, so for the United, uh, for the um, Esquimalt United Church um, on their community wing part of the building, um, we did a $630,000 renovation in three and a half weeks, um, transformed that side of the building in a way that was, that was financially viable, increased their equity, um, built up their capacity in the community, and uh, saved them a, a, a lot of money. Cool. Okay. So what I, I'm just going to um, pause here for a technological kind of intervention. I'm going to mute everybody, and then when it's your turn to speak, if you could unmute yourself, um, then that will help to cut, cut down on the background noise. Okay. Um, Matthew, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure. I'm Matt, Matthew Bennett. I'm an associate at Enberry Lion Consultants. We are based out of Toronto. We're urban planners, land economists, and market analysts. And so we were retained on behalf of EDGE to conduct the national property inventory of United Church properties across Canada and to make some recommendations about uh, new approaches to making better real estate decisions. Great, thank you. Chris, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, so Chris Tavella, I've been with EDGE for the last two years. Part of my work's really been uh, helping congregations kind of on a piecework basis around uh, renewal options for uh, property, but looking at the much larger, larger picture, we are trying to take kind of a more of a holistic approach and, and bring, in the, bring in more of a national framework. So that's been my role as of late, kind of working closely with Matt. And okay, we can hear you very well, Chris. So I wonder if you could speak up a bit, or I don't know if there's anything you can do on your laptop to make it a bit louder. Kathy, hello. Okay. Uh, does that work there? If I'm closer, or maybe let me. Uh, I'll, I'll grab a headset quickly. Okay, sounds good. Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself? Unmute yourself first. 
There, that's better. I'm Kathy Hamilton. I'm a United Church minister. I serve a regional ministry north of Quebec, and north of Montreal in Quebec. There are nine congregations involved. And um, they are all, um, no, almost all, uh, owners of small rural churches. One in particular, the furthest north, is in a town. And they have had two community meetings. Um, which have uh, developed three possibilities for developing the building. And I'm here to find out more about how one might move that forward. Um, the congregation itself is very old, a really ancient people who aren't really able to provide a lot of leadership. So I'm really at the point of wanting some, um, wanting to be able to, to suggest some models that involve the community in um in building development great okay thank you hello um and now it looks like um, michelle has been able to join um chris so we're glad for that to happen hello michelle you look very different yesterday i saw her and she was a witch, I was a witch. that's true that's true <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm so sorry to be late. Uh, the city is under construction. Our corporate internet was down too, so I couldn't do the call from uh, from work. So I got here. No Thank you for kind of hopping in your car, or the subway or whatever, and, and joining us. I really appreciate you making that effort. So thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Perhaps you could introduce yourself, Michelle. Yes, I am the uh, acting manager of affordable housing for Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Um, so I look after the, my, my team and I look after the Ontario region. And uh, we've had the great pleasure of working with uh, Chris and the United Church team on um, a, a big initiative to um, uh, rethink their, uh, their approach to land um, in a way to, uh, I think, add some real value to communities across Canada as well as to the church itself. Great, thank you. Okay, so Chris, perhaps I think we'll come back to you at this point um, with that segue provided by Michelle. Um, I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about kind of what is the kind of big picture kind of initiative that's happening for the United Church of Canada as it <laughs> kind of provides some um, leadership and exploration around what to do with the properties that are part of the, the, the United Church in, Can in Canada. Yeah, for sure. So I'll talk briefly. I'll even go back as kind of starting with the uh, edge and the creation of that because the intent for that was really to support congregations around ministry renewal and new forms of ministry. And through that, it was really identified that there was this huge need around property and you can't really do one without looking at them both in tandem. So what we did, there was a comprehensive review uh, in 2014 where it surveyed approximately 600 uh, plus United Churches across the country. And without even asking property related questions, about a third of those identified as needing to either sell or redevelop within the short term. Um, probably within the time frame of five, five to seven years or so. And that's already dating back uh, three years now, almost four. So the huge need, we were kind of working on an ad hoc basis, knowing that we would never be able to kind of facilitate what's happening and knowing that the congregations doing, them, uh, doing it on their own, the outcomes were very bleak. So there's a lot of learnings that I'm sure Matt will touch on that we just aren't really well designed to do this kind of work uh, from a couple of different fronts. The other component too is uh, our So we're losing you a little bit. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So yeah, you have this kind of conflict between almost like a dilapidated infrastructure, well-intended uh, trustees and congregation with the intent to do... Um, So, Chris, we seem to be cutting out quite a bit. Yeah. We're 
we're not hearing you. components. What we really saw was long playing around with So it met with Silly Me to kind of be. He was fortunate enough to put us in conversation with the. Okay. I can hear Chris just fine. Yeah, well, it's working well from my end here, uh, Sarah. Okay, so everything is fine too. Okay, so maybe it's just me who's having the trouble. So that's good. <laughs> I mean, it's not good, but it's better. Um, all right, go ahead. Yeah, so one of the pieces there then was Michelle and I just met over a few sessions and said, how do we really kind of bring this together? So uh, she had the brilliant idea of let's, let's facilitate a conversation with the uh, key stakeholders in this. So she helped kind of bring in developers, city planners, and who else was there? There's um, a, a number of uh, a number of developers for profit and non profit we had you know it 's been a very interesting process because when we started we didn 't know what we were going to get out of this uh, initiative. We just knew and come to the same conclusion we had the project not proceeding so uh brought the group together with chris and rob dalglish and um a question you know um if the how can the united church ensure that it always has space for worship and social purpose in perpetuity so that was kind of our governing statement um we brought this table of stakeholders together, a number of whom had worked on church redevelopments for United Church or other churches, some of which being completed and some of which happened. And we were really getting the financial community develop successful redevelopments. And we thought, we, it's funny because when you start these things, plan where you're going if you don't already understand what you've got which sounds so self-evident, yet we didn't approach it from that way to start with. And it became clear in the course of the executive roundtable that we did that the first step had to be a national land inventory. And we found that thought daunting and exciting, the prospect of mapping basically 3,300 sites and exploring them. The first thing, which Matt will talk about, is what they worked on, which is from the real estate perspective, what is the highest and best uh, use of the properties, where, where does the value lie in the portfolio? But then the church itself is going to look at, from the missional point of view, where where does the value reside? Because that may match with economic value, but it may not. And so that's a very important uh, detail as well. So we came away from the round table, and I made the business case to CMHC that it would be very important for us to um, see this process through, because we knew there was a tremendous commitment among churches in general, and the United Church in particular, to social justice work. So we knew we would get affordable housing out of this. The church has committed a thousand units of affordable housing uh, under this initiative, and I think it, it's very realistic. It's, it's going to get surpassed, as well as various sorts of community hubs and things I think we'll see. And in fact, one of the participants at the first round table now retired, but Phil Abrahams, who headed the Shelter Support and Housing Administration for the City of Toronto, he came out with a great line. He said, you're never going to find a soup kitchen in the lobby of a luxury condo. And as you know, the important role churches play in being that third space in society. So the first thing was, my takeaway was, I got to get some money for the church. We came up with a really good deal. And then um, the United Church managed, Chris, Chris and Rob managed the uh, RFP process, which resulted in the successful win to NBLC, a wonderful firm that Matt, Matt works with. And uh, then he spearheaded the whole project of doing this daunting prospect of mapping 3,300 sites across the country. And there's more that's gone on after the inventory, but I don't know, uh, Sarah, if you want Matt to take it away now with uh, what was done to, to, to create this inventory. You're on mute. Sarah, we can't hear you. There, now you can hear me. <laughs> Yes, Matthew, it, Matt, if you could share about the work that you did, that would be great. Sure. Um, so Chris, Chris and Michelle framed it really well. Um, we were 
we started to uh, to speak to congregations, speak to Chris and, and Rob at Edge, and we're really finding that there was this loss of opportunity and, and revenue potential in various real estate initiatives. There was this inability throughout the church to cross pollinate and share ideas. We did find some successful cases of real estate development across the country, but not many people knew about them very broadly outside of their local communities. And there was also this additional layer of trustees feeling very conflicted with the management of their real estate, uh, being charged with, with maintaining and operating a congregation on a property that may have been endowed to you and to your, or to your community hundreds of years ago creates this pressure and burden to do well and do by good, do, do good by your community. But as the, the uh, demographic factors evolve and economic factors evolve around your, around your community, the reality is that you have to take a really hard strategic look at, at the real estate uh, asset in and of itself to first understand what you're dealing with and where there might be opportunities. So the first piece of our work was to really to develop an inventory and then to screen the inventory from, from a pure hard-nosed real estate perspective to say, where does the church have strategic real estate? And strategic, I mean simply by real estate value, not the missional value that the congregation may, may offer within its community. That's a separate piece of, of this work that is ongoing. Uh, our, our focus was purely, purely on the real estate. And so uh, if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Yeah, I can so show you. if you look along the bottom, there's an option to share a screen down there. I got it. And if you click on that. So can you see this? Yes. Great. So the, the church provided us with, uh, with an Excel sheet, effectively, of uh, where they thought their, their congregations were across the country. And we translated that into this database. And the database is popular. All the points that, that you see as I scroll around here are United Church properties in different locations across the country. And so you can see the inventory is very wide ranging. It's, it's, it's uh, concentrated in certain geographic regions where there is uh, lots of economic potential, but then there are also congregations uh, in rural locations. And so one of the questions that, that Rob and Chris challenged us with was, okay, it's the development opportunities in, in urban locations generally are stronger than in rural. And what can we offer to rural congregations? So this started us thinking through a longer term, broader, almost portfolio-wide uh, thought process about how to make better real estate decisions and, and how to potentially change the polity of the church so that we can distribute wealth more broadly. Currently, if a congregation undertakes a real estate development uh, process, the majority of those funds retain uh, are, are, are withheld within the congregation itself and not distributed broadly. And so, um, so that's, a, that's another piece that I'll talk about. But the, the inventory, um, what we did was we effectively mapped all of the properties. So you can see as I clicked on points here, you'll start to see different data. Uh, and, and so this allows for the church to start to screen properties from a real estate perspective. And we, we did that as part of our work. But also to begin to think through okay, what do we really have in different locations? And if a congregation is thinking about a development, say here in, um, where are we? Blue Rocks, Nova Scotia, certainly very beautiful piece of the, of the country. Um, but the economic prospect for redevelopment on this site is limited. So this is a, a site that, uh, Uh, the property was no longer of use to the church. We would say, from a, from a purely real estate perspective, um, simple terms, hand us to a broker, and the broker, the real estate broker, is likely to get you highest and best value. But if we back away from this site and we go to let's fly over to a, a property in Vancouver, this is Lakeview Multicultural United Church. This is on the uh, the Skyway Transit line. We have uh, infill development happening nearby, lots of signs of economic maturation and pressures for growth, we would say do not hand the site to a broker simply because you're likely to be able to do something bigger here. There, are, there may be opportunities to include the, the congregation within a redevelopment uh, at, at the end of the process or, or to leverage the site for highest and best use value 
and then to relocate the church to a, a, a space that suits their needs as they evolve. And so the, the real estate inventory is it's step one in a broader process, but it's a process, it's a tool that allows Chris and his team to say, okay, here's, here's where we should be uh, taking the initiative to be strategic and to make a relatively small investment up front, but in some, some professional due diligence prior to, to letting a, a property slip through our fingers and losing the value and the uplift potential that might be, that might be available. So that's step one in our work. I don't know if you want me to continue. I could probably go for the balance of the hour. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very fascinating. Um, so I'm, I'm aware for me, there are some questions that are kind of coming up. Um, sure, why don't we stop here and, and allow people to ask some questions about that works for you? Yeah. Kathy, you're Joel. Do you have Can any questions? A... Yeah, go ahead, Joel. Can I ask a question right away, Matthew? Yeah. Um, is this tool proprietary or is it available to be shared with folks that are working with United Churches? Um, that's a very good question. It's, uh, it's a question for Chris, I believe. It's uh, our, our retainers um, open. We're, we're on, on call as an ad hoc consultant on a planning basis, effectively, in real estate basis. But the tool has been provided to, to Edge and, and they do have that. I'm not sure, Chris, if you want to jump in to discuss yeah, how you can. For sure. Plan. So, the way Edge operates too is we're, we're an open resource. A lot of this work has just come through from Matt, so we're still in the process of, of filtering it. The larger part is going to be that community engagement piece and make sure that the proper messaging is in order so we don't have kind of twisted stories about what's happening. The last thing we really want is uh, people to start thinking that that national is out for their land. And I know one of the pieces Matt hasn't talked to yet, but it's really this idea that part of the recommendation was that there would be this property resource group that would almost be kind of an internal uh, United Church bear hug that would support congregations as they look through uh, redevelopment projects. But yeah, we're definitely an open resource in that regard and uh, willing to share. So just a supplemental question. Mm -hmm. uh, working with a number of clients here in Alberta and um, I guess uh, I'm thinking that the type of work that's been done uh, with this resource uh, which speed up a great deal of initial research in various different places and help some of the governing bodies here. Um, and I guess, uh, is there a way in which uh, there, this could be rolled out on sort of subscription basis to uh, individuals like myself working with uh, governing bodies to be able to um, use the data sort of on a test basis or at least in a, in a focused area. Um, I, the reason I'm asking is because I think there's some urgency for this uh, in a couple of areas here in Western Canada. And um, I'd, I'd like to be able to get some of this information into the system more quickly uh, as governing bodies kind of take a look at it um, across, across Alberta and elsewhere. Yeah, no, I definitely, Definitely hear you. So I, I think it's a much a much more deeper conversation that, I, that I'm willing to have kind of as a as a result of this meeting. But I think there are some synergies where we could uh, work together to carry forward this work because we know the need the needs. Uh, it's big and it's urgent. So so maybe what I'll do is I'll uh, send you an email, Chris, and we can have a further discussion about how this might uh, get implemented in some ways and see where things are going. Happy to that, do that. That sound good, Chris. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, Thank you. Did you have any questions or things that were coming for you from um, Matt's presentation? Well, as it happens, I chaired the comprehensive review task group that mandated that survey. And so I am very thrilled to see the outcome of that work actually rolling out into a usable, usable um, tool. And it's just happenstance that I'm on this call, but I'm really, really thrilled to see it. It was an unbelievable amount of work to get to this point. Um, I guess I have a similar question to what Joel was asking in that, is it available to, um, how can it be used by uh, individual small congregations to help, um, help us move forward? Is there a plan to match me with some other church like me or like, talk a little bit more about the bear hug that you talked about, please? Yeah. 
that's the that's the piece that's currently up for up for uh, discussion right now and we're trying to co-create it as we go through it's one of those pieces that we know um the capacity is really is really the finer the finer uh i guess piece that will need some detail and some fleshing out but where we've landed on kind of initially starting that is creating um almost an interim property resource group that could kind of start it, build some small wins, and then eventually evolve, evolve into kind of the, the greater polity. Because one of the other big pieces is we don't want to wait for our polity in this. We know we're in the midst of kind of restructuring and that's years out. So if we just wait for everything to get in place where we could act as this national resource group that could intervene and support congregations as needed, we'll know we'll, we've missed the boat and we'll lost some significant uh, churches. So right now uh, we're kind of on almost still that, um, that pilot, that pilot phase, but it's, it's an, it's really an ongoing discussion of, of how we're going to kind of involve it and bring everyone in. So if you have any thoughts or ideas, love to hear those. Can I just add, yeah, add one point at this uh, point? Um, from CMHC's point of view, we see this as a multi-year uh, commitment to work with the United Church. Um, it's already been actually two years that Chris yeah. and I have been working together. We had six months with Chris and Rob Dalglish where we kind of figured out how to move forward, looked at the examples of things that worked and didn't culminating in around the first round table, which then the idea came out of the uh, inventory and land strategy. I got the funding for that. Um, uh, and then um, uh, the church did the RFP and BLC was hired. We did a second round table this past June where we tested the inventory. Um, Matt and his, uh, his colleagues presented it and we had a lot of you know, um, leading folks in for-profit and non-profit uh, community and housing developments um, to, to sort of test it from that point of view, knowing that a lot of the work is still gonna be done in the church. And we're now sort of, CMHC is committing to a longer term partnership because Kathy, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the challenge is it just can't be a great looking map, which we know it is. It's got to really play out. So Chris is working on policies and pilot projects and we are providing uh, resources from our side as well to really ensure that I, I would say probably within six to eight months there's a very robust tool available for the whole country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a piece I'd like to just kind of um, th put into the conversation. And um, so part of what I, I bring to these conversations is that I'm relatively new to the United Church of Canada. I've only been a member for um, five years. And, um, and uh, so I'm, I'm new, I don't have kind of um, that inbuilt knowledge about how things work or don't work. Um, so I guess part of my curiosity is when I hear um, Chris, speaking about things like um, distributed funds. And when I hear um, Joel asking questions about how does, how does an individual church access this, I guess my, my wondering is, my understanding is the United Church is um, kind of, the congregations are independent. They have a lot of control independently. And, and, I, and I'm just trying to understand how this all comes together. Um, or how the national organization has influence and what that relationship is and what it needs to be, I guess, perhaps going forward. So Kathy and Joel, I'd really be interested in your thoughts about that. And I wonder if that's a little bit of what Chris is, is kind of also inviting. Yeah, so others can join in. I, I think my first response to that is... You didn't say who you are. Sorry, Rob, <laughs> Rob Dowdley. Hi, Rob! I referenced him, but you, nobody saw him. We've now kind of moved the camera. <laughs> I was in the neighborhood. Anyway, um, Rob Dalglish and I, I am the executive director of EDGE and work with Chris on this and Michelle. So <clears throat> the, um, the real advantage around property is when we can work together. So the, the challenge to the church is how do we work together on this? We, we can eventually get polity in place that can support and maybe even mandate certain ways that we need to work together. But there's a, any, anybody that we've, shop this strategy around for it's it's always questions like you're raising how does it work and how do i access it as opposed to this isn't a good idea like everyone agrees that this is a good idea so it's on us to figure out how we can work together and we know that there's huge payback when we can do that and we can do that on a voluntary basis we don't have to mandate it 
regular in a regulatory way, we can actually choose out of our you know insight and local context to 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 uh, pool properties to collaborate missionally to uh, whatever it is. Well, what this tool and resource is going to do is to give best in class information and ways of thinking about it and models that uh, show some promise and track record uh, to really inform the decision making. So, I mean, uh, how that happens on the ground, we're, we're hoping that not only will congregations be uh, more able to connect with strategic partners in their neighborhood around how to make social impact, uh, as well as rethink how they uh, how worship continues or how the religious activities of the of the church can be more sustainable um, but also how we can begin to not just one-off basis but how we can cluster together uh, how congregations can uh, work strategically how regions or uh, at the present presbyteries can develop a regional mission plan uh, where we layer on the mission profile information for each of the congregations together with the community information and together with the property information so that we can begin to make strategic decisions around the whole asset or the whole community and how we both uh, carry out mission and how we make sustainable um, religious life of, of the United Church. So I don't know if that um, gets it. And Chris also has it. Yeah, and then over to Chris. <laughs> the other piece too we are kind of talking about is the intent that uh, we'll start this as almost an interim piece, but it'll be more robust in almost that six months to eight month timeline where we could then have a resource that, rather than uh, reaching out, we already understand that kind of presbyteries and conferences are under stress. That there could be this resource group in place that the first kind of con call or contact from the congregation to the resource group where then they can initially start bouncing ideas and it's really this co-creative space where we really haven't had the opportunity to, to go before a lot of the time it's just been relying on trustees and members of the congregation when matt will really touch on these are really complex decisions any organization would have almost a, a army of development experts ready to go on each of these sites so uh, we really need to kind of be uh, uh, acknowledging that and provide that. So that's the that's the kind of the uh, direction we'll we'll hope to be in the next uh, short term. Oh, sorry, was there someone else who wanted to speak over in that trio over there? No, I he just put me back on the camera. <laughs> so um, just to make sure that I'm understanding, Chris, then are you suggesting that the next step is to create a kind of a, um, a, a resource team that would be available to kind of go alongside, say, the map tool um, to kind of be, to work with churches if they desired? Is that what you're imagining? Yeah, so we've established that already, uh, as is the idea is that it'll just continue to get more robust as, as uh, people get on board. So uh, it's already happening as we speak. So yeah, that's definitely the direction. Definitely the direction forward. Okay. Kathy and Joel or anyone else, did you have any questions, further questions? I, I guess uh, I'd just like to um, put in uh, something that we've been able to do uh, recently here uh, in Alberta, specifically to the Alberta context, uh, we've established, um, led out of Edmonton Presbytery, uh, with the guidance of Faleski Flynn, uh, who are a tax lawyer and accounting firm uh, nationwide, uh, we've established and settled a land trust. And it took a lot of work uh, from Faleski Flynn and myself to uh, pull this together in such a way that it could actually kind of fit with United Church governance. We have established it and it is now in the process of moving forward on a couple of projects in the Edmonton area. And I just simply want to put that across that for from my work, that concept of a trust um, actually is something that I feel we need to investigate further because what it allows uh, stressed congregations and governing bodies to do is effectively, uh, for lack of a better phrase, sell the asset to themselves uh, and thereby give opportunity for the uh, church as a whole 
to, to draw upon the expertise that is being conveyed here by Chris and Matthew. So there's that piece around how the asset is held during a transitional period. Uh, we've been able to successfully get it set up here in Alberta and um, uh, it, because it's a separate arm's length governing body for lands, it should, uh, well, it, it, it actually will endure under Alberta law, which is very helpful. So just that piece seems to have been something that I would like to be able to add into the process in some kind of creative way uh, going forward. So Matt, I saw you kind of nodding your head around that one. Can you unmute yourself, thanks? Yeah, Joel, that's really interesting. We, we um, partway through our process, began to, began to understand the complexity of the, of the regulatory and, and polity of the United Church. And uh, at our suggestion, uh, Chris and, and Rob retained Robbins Appleby in Toronto, who are a, a national law firm. And to help to start to think around how we might be able to take this idea of the property resource group, um, frame that out in terms of its objectives and the goals that we that we hope that it can satisfy, and then to think through the the legal implications of that and how that might fit within the traditional regulatory structure. So maybe Chris and Rob can, can speak to to where that work is now. But um, I think you're on the, you're you're going down the right path. There needs to be some sort of mechanism that allows. Uh, that, that allows professional expertise to be interjected uh, to give the congregation support and, and have that happen within a, a framework that makes sense for everybody. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Just to add to that, one of the, one of the second things we heard at, uh, at the round table where we were kind of testing this idea is that we really need a clarity and a competency from the congregations. There's so many developers that have been frustrated with working with churches because simple decisions that would normally take a week all of a sudden have to go for congregational vote, presbytery approval, and then next thing you know, you've had a, a couple months go by. So what they're really looking for is if the church had an internal group that could work with the congregation, identify and really become clear on what it needs from the property. So many congregations say they might want affordable housing, but they really want highest and best use and vice versa. So how is there, um, how do you kind of determine that balance uh, between it? So the idea is that the, this resource group could work with them and balance and really put a, a business planning and a practical sense behind it where it's been proven by preliminary financials, you know what you want, and then you could go to the market and have those conversations. And I thought you were done. I'm yeah. sorry. No, 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 go ahead. And I know. <laughs> sorry. I, I didn't, didn't, this no, is no, no, an unusual format for me. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Joel's point about the land trust. Uh, the whole notion of how property gets held, there's the United Church approach to property. And also at Canada Mortgage and Housing, we work with all sorts of nonprofit and for-profit developers across the country and look at a lot of different models. And at this point, our sense is our partnership with the United Church is going to continue for several more years. We are looking to provide um, some best practice experience and some uh, good um, structure around some of the work that the church is doing just to make sure to your point Joel that the the land is held properly there's advantages and disadvantages to a lot of different legal structures so we will be a resource to the church as the next steps are figured out um, so it is a, a collaboration and and I think fairly uh, long term too <laughs> okay. any other questions all right um, Rob, I'm just wondering if you're still there and if you wanted any further comments on this subject um, at this point. And if not, we'll, I think we'll move to Paul because he's very patiently uh, uh, observing us have this very uh, in-house conversation. Um, but uh, Rob, I just wanted to just kind of give you a, a last comment on this, on this subject. I think you need to turn on your mic. There you go. You're on. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Sarah. So, uh, I mean, one of the things that has been um, uh, just a, a continue, it kind of haunts me, is that there is such an opportunity here for us. And what really encourages me is the enthusiasm of stakeholders outside of the church. So, there, uh, 
with uh, Michelle and CMHC, I mean, we, we, talk, we call Michelle our, our profit. <laughs> real estate. Property uh, profit. Profit, property <laughs> profit. Um, but there's just a real, I mean, government funding is on the decline for social uh, 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 transformation in communities. Foundation funding is in decline. Private donations are in decline. And everybody is asking the question, how do we address the issues that we have? And, uh, and there's a great enthusiasm and hopefulness around the churches uh, entering into this, uh, with the caveat that if we can get our act together uh, on the implementation side. So uh, it's not easy for uh, a church to uh, change its culture. Uh, we know that. We've all probably been to a certain extent in, involved in that work. But the, the opportunity here is... Um, is country impacting, like it's nation building. Uh, and it's a new opportunity to be richly engaged in this, the uh, kind of stakeholder um, matrix uh, that is addressing these issues. That, that happens both at the local level and we're seeing it now at, at, all, at all levels. So I would just you know, uh, encourage people to continue to engage, to continue to ask the questions and to be hopeful about what we could do together. Can you give us an example, Rob, of something that you see evolving? I, my understanding is that Chris has been working on some pilot projects. Is that anything you can share at this point? Well, with property, that's always a little, um, that's, it's always a little difficult to go public before certain stakeholders okay. engage. Um, but uh, let me say that um, there, there's a project in Hamilton where the city is very excited and uh, it's in a zone where they're willing to put up $200,000 per affordable unit to go to more, uh, to more deeply affordable as opposed to just affordable. Uh, it's right on the LRT, it's right by McMaster University. There are, there's conversations about a social, uh, social enterprise incubator in, um, in partnership with the Groot School of Business, uh, potentially student housing or mixed and affordable housing uh, there, um, there's a project in, uh, in Toronto that's very much the village in the city that might be mixed housing, but also a community center where uh, three generation programming involving uh, childcare as well as seniors residents uh, and, and to build the kind of village that can raise a child in the city as opposed to the kind of village ch children are raised in. But the village, you know, so, and that's, that's the kind of work it's like, and, and the other, you know, at, we're, we're being invited to tables through, through Michelle and CMHC. I was at the table with Jean-Yves Duclos, who's the federal minister of social welfare, families and uh, women, and uh, at, talking about the question of affordable housing. So, um, and able to sit at that table, it's not just about housing, it's about homes and resilient communities. And to be heard, that, uh, the recognition that the church has something, some important role in this uh, process is there's just a huge opportunity right now. So uh, we've been at more tables than we can keep track of. I didn't even know some of these tables existed. So, and anyway. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Paul, thank you so much for, for joining us as we've been having this, this conversation and um, would love to hear some more about some of the work that, that you're doing um, with the Hero Works, which is, sounds a, a very intriguing model. And uh, part of my curiosity would be about how do you, what is your network to get the volunteers involved in this kind of project? Because it, it sounds like they're central to, the, um, to its success. Well, uh, it's interesting to hear the the conversation and where everyone is um, is at. Uh, I see our, our program sort of running parallel in terms of its development to what it is um, that the uh, Edge program and the UCP across the country is looking um, to achieve. Um, I don't have the breadth of knowledge uh, from a national scale, but I do um, understand from a local concept of, of what appears to have need to have happened happen. Um, uh, you know, I've worked with um, United Church and a congregation um, here and a couple of organizations um, like that. And uh, I know that, that the church here um, had a decision of, should we sell or should we not sell? And they decided, well, we're going to engage the community more 
um, and not sell. And that was their decision. And so they decided to, as many people have spoken here, you know, looking at, well, what other nonprofits can we partner with? Who in the community can we bring in with the expertise to run some of these programs that will embed us into the community in a way that both builds the congregation, builds the community impact, um, builds the financial stability um, of the organization. So I saw them make some strategic decisions um, years ago, um, maybe four, four or five years ago is when they started that process. And uh, a couple of years into that, they had a couple of other um, nonprofits operating in part of their building. Um, that, that sort of, um, allows for a broader impact and a broader um, mandate uh, that I see the the United Church is often embarking on. That enables um, uh, community to uh, in, to partner in a in a deeper way. Uh, so, what uh, what we're what we're creating is a is a way to mobilize community. Um, we've been in op Hero Work here in Victoria has been operating um, for several years. We have some deep networks and a lot of resources that we can bring to bear. But even as um, as an individual uh, without a nonprofit, um, without the connections, and uh, I'm still able to do a half a million dollar renovation um, here here locally. And I think that has to do with um, how we. One that there's a strategic positioning of um, of the uh, of the church and in the community that um, that there's a story to tell that we can engage stakeholders in that story so that they're motivated to make their community better and then provide them a vehicle that leverages their time and their efforts in order to in order to do that. So I see where here we're potentially coming in is once the church kind of knows what it is that they're looking to achieve and has a strategy around that and is looking to um, uh, redevelop uh, their infrastructure that um, we've got a program that that we're looking to scale and teach and empower other people to uh, do these kinds of events that uh, that is that not only redevelops the infrastructure but renews the, the, the congregation renews the the, um, the neighborhood uh, for example the the United Church now I, I called to, to look at a space and they're like oh we're booked into next year for the rentals of their spaces now so they're on each of these levels they're 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 being strengthened by deepening their ties in the community but this extravaganza of um, of this massive renovation happening with hundreds of people um, is sort of a newsworthy event that that sort of gives a shot in the arm um, to the congregation. So I'm I'm interested in in following along with the conversations and how our program um, can dovetail to empower some of these um, some of these groups on the, on the actual ground where when you're actually looking to get get the results and you're moving past the planning stage or you're getting close to the end of the planning stages and what that development looks like, um, then, then we've got some pretty cool stuff that can be brought to bear on it. Great, thank you, Paul. And Joel, I want to make sure that you have time also to speak because I know that you're working with some specific projects and wondering if you would like to share kind of some of those and, uh, and what, what is evolving in the work that you're doing. Uh, <laughs> and if you don't want to, that's fine. I'm kind of, am I putting you on the spot here? Um, I, I think one of the pieces that, again, coming back to it, I've actually ended up focusing a lot more on before we get into <clears throat> what do we want to do or how do we want to engage our community. Uh, I've ended up ended up focusing uh, the conversation more on. <clears throat> How do we wish to hold the assets and how do we wish to who do we want to work with? Um, because I think that it's the question of how we own our land assets that's actually going to really um, give us the capacity to do the things that need to uh, unfold in the near future. And I guess the other piece of that then is what I've been able to do is kind of assemble a back office team of people here that I kind of refer to and we kind of do some modeling and some workups of the type of work that could take place. Because one of the things that I find is that congregations in the United Church and elsewhere 
have difficulty envisioning the kind of thing that Paul just described um, until they can actually see a model of it. Like it's great that in Victoria, there's now a, a model there at Esquimalt that we can, you know, that folks can look at. So it's that sort of combination of modeling and the question of how do we, how do we best own our assets? So as a result, I don't spend a whole lot of time now uh, thinking too much about what are we actually going to build um, or what are we actually going to do, sell or stay. Um, it's much more focused on how do we model what the future might look like and then how do we own our assets to make that happen. I don't know, that sounds pretty theoretical. Um, don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> Kathy? I have a question. Um, I haven't heard much conversation about municipalities and I wonder if there are models where municipalities become partners in um, either church ownership or in leading uh, programs on church locations. Um, the experience in my neighborhood is that the big United Church in this town was sold to the municipality to become a library and three years later it is still a blight on Main Street with uh, cardboard, uh, uh, plywood windows and so, you know, the municipality hasn't really moved very quickly. And, um, we're sort of the bad guys, even though it's not our project. So I wonder what experience others have with municipalities across the, across the country. Go ahead. I could maybe uh, make a comment on that because we do work in municipalities all across the country at CMHC. Um, in general, municipalities like churches and like to partner with churches. I'm not familiar with this particular circumstance, but I gave the example of the, the head of the social, or former head of the, the social services for Toronto who talked about the, you'll never have a soup kitchen in the lobby of a luxury condo. And this notion I think is, um, is felt very strongly by a lot of the municipalities that I meet with in Ontario. Um, this notion of the third space is very important and the church's role in society. I think we're going to see an awful lot more partnerships between churches and municipalities over the next few years. Um, within the next couple of months, the Minister of Housing or Minister responsible for CMHC, who's also responsible for the National Housing Strategy, is going to be announcing the details of that strategy. There's going to be a huge infusion of money to um, lift a lot of families out of poverty, reduce homelessness by 50%. It's quite a significant strategy. And it's based on things that are relevant to the local community context and there's going to be a lot of money flowing into the system. The direct investment by the federal government will be, um, as they announced in the last budget, um, over a billion dollars a year for the next 10 years with a cumulative economic reach of about $40 billion across Canada. So if the churches in the United Church, I think it's very prudent to take this inventory as, as the edge group is here, take the inventory that Matt and his team have done and then apply a missional filter on that as well and start getting the, the uh, the country, the United Church in the, across the country, ready to move when the money starts coming. Because I think a key piece of the strategy is going to be partnerships among all different levels of government, for-profit, non-profit, to really create just, you know, as Paul was talking about, the sort of vital integrated communities that I think we're all looking for. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> That's exciting news that you're sharing there. Um, so is the, is the possibility that you're suggesting, Michelle, that um, municipalities might be um, coming with more funding to work with churches around, say, housing projects and hubs? I think there will be funding, and I also think there will be the will to find ways to strengthen and revitalize communities. Um, I know through uh, the EDGE process now, I can think of one community, in fact, where the municipality went to the church to offer um, some additional land adjacent the church land if the church would take the leadership in redeveloping. Well, the church really hasn't got the money right now, but if the money were to come, you know, the, the, the municipality in that particular case has identified both the church land and the adjacent land, which they own, as being valuable for revitalizing the community, creating a community hub, affordable housing, etc. So they know what they want. And I think you'll find across Canada, most municipalities know what they want. They're often just short of the money. And if the national housing strategy provides 
money and these are seen as strategic opportunities, we may see the, the, those boarded up windows, Kathy, come off the United Church. Yeah, um, just one final piece. I, I think what strikes me um, is the piece that, that kind of was at the beginning of the conversation about the limited capacity that individual churches have to um, take advantage of this opportunity. They don't have the skill sets. And, um, and I hear that there is the possibility of, of, um, of a team, but I guess my sense is there would need to be a lot of resources to help. There's a lot of churches across the country. It's hard to imagine how there could be enough support to, to help. I, I, I just, that boggles my mind a little bit, but I'm curious other people's reflections or contributions. Sorry, you're, you're muted. Oh. Um, I think um, one of the things would be, it doesn't mean that the churches or the United Church centrally, even through this property resource group they're looking at developing, doesn't mean that they would do all the development, but they might put out an RFP and get a, a developer to develop to their specifications in certain locations. And not every site is gonna be redeveloped. I mean, that's a key piece Matt was speaking earlier about the prior, prioritization exercise. What are the right opportunities for the church to really contribute in, in a different way? Mm -hmm. I, I may add in something. I think, um, you know, for different, well, for the uh, church as a whole, but also the individual churches to be able to have a vision of what it is that they're looking to achieve with that has a lot of power all by itself. So um, no one group has the capacity, but you know they certainly have the capacity to partner um, with other organizations or other people that do have the capacity. And I think it's that willingness to be open to that partnership, to put a vision out there of a community hub or whatever that uh, community asset looks like that's best for that local community and those and, and, and the neighbors that are, are, are around, I think has a huge amount of power. So as this process sort of starts to evolve and, 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 uh, and filter down, to be able to empower the congregation to, to, to have a vision um, and then to partner and then see where those partnerships uh, go and to allocate enough time to allow that evolution to occur. And I, I think that you're totally, um, totally right, Michelle, that you know, getting ready now for what's going to happen later is key because if that preparatory work, both on a national and a local level, um, isn't there, then um, you're going to be really challenged because it takes time to put all that uh, all that together. Um, but uh, when the when, as you say, hopefully the money starts flowing or the partners start 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 flowing, then you're ready to hit the ground um, hit the ground running. I know when we worked here, um, we pushed uh, the local congregation back a year to give them another year um, to figure things out. And then once they figured enough things out, then we were able to move forward. Um, so, but it's a crucial point that that, um, that visioning and strategic modeling of what that would look like and what's that case for support um, to actually know that we think it's actually going to work. Um, and it's that, and that allows for the mobilization and the partnerships of the community. So. Okay, well, we're kind of coming up to the, the end of our time. And um, one of the things we like to do just by way of closing and uh, kind of honoring our conversation together is the, the invitation is there to say, kind of what are you taking away from this call? Kind of what's been the gift or the learning or the, the piece that you're taking away from this conversation um, today? So if we could just kind of go around and, and offer that in to our time and then, uh, and then we'll close. So. Um, whoever would like to go first is welcome to. Well, I don't mind going first. Um, as well as working for CMHC, I am a member of the United Church, and I think there's a number of very interesting um, energies at play in the country right now. This, a lot of municipal and um, third, third sector, uh, uh, like, like third space assets, like the United Church assets, are, are getting old. They need to be redeveloped. There's um, energy around all different kinds of development. Um, so I think that kind of energy is really interesting. I think the United Church is well positioned to um, capitalize on that. We're already hearing about some great stuff that's underway across the country. Um, and it's a church that was founded on the notion of partnership. So 
that's, I think, something that it's going to take forward to the next iteration. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So I'll go next. Um, I very much understand the need for a national priority and a national process. Um, I'm also very aware that none of the nine churches that I work with will be on that priority list because they're all tiny and very far away. And I hope that there will also be support and encouragement for them to find ways of using their assets. You know, they're not going to be the million dollar development or the several million dollar development, but they might be the coffee shop that the town needs to create a core and some support for how to get there would be really, really appreciated. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I'll go next. And maybe the, the perspective that uh, that I'm taking away, uh, Kathy, to your point, is that all all of these these community groups need some support, and whether it's from folks like Paul, who who can help them uh, vision what might be possible as they collaborate with partners in the community, or or folks like like myself, who might be you know thinking about the the harder economic numbers, these groups. It's important that, that we align these groups with the, the skills that they have, the energy that they have, and then connect them with resources that can help them to make uh, strategic decisions. And so there's different scales to that, certainly, but I think we're all on the right path in, in, in thinking that through. Great. Thank you. And thank you so much, Matt, for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Um, well, I want to echo uh, Rob's words around um, the nation building and the excitement of this opportunity. We're talking about potentially thousands of sites, thousands of places in the, uh, in the many communities, both big and small, that can strengthen those communities, that can strengthen our bonds and our and our neighborhoods, and um, and uh, and carry forth the, the mission uh, of the um, of the church and of, um, of making the world a better place. And so I just think that that's exciting. Always good to keep in mind that uh, that bigger vision of what we're looking to achieve um, together, uh, whether that's uh, in the local location or on the broader scope of things. Um, you know, it would be pretty amazing if in 10, 15 years from now, we're seeing many, many communities that are being helped to transform as a result of some of the conversations and actions that the people here are taking. So that's great. Great. Thanks, Paul. Joel, you need to unmute yourself, I think. There we are. Uh, I guess I'm newly aware that... Um, uh, for the past 18 months or so, as I've been uh, struggling with uh, with uh, legal advice and United Church of Canada uh, policy to implement some of the tools that we're trying to put in place out here, that I've kind of lost track of the national, uh, I suppose, conversation amongst different regions of the church on this issue, on this whole issue of development and mission and, and planning. And I would just like to encourage that uh, if there's resources through EDGE that can be pulled together to re-energize that national network uh, because there's a lot of things happening in different regions and certainly we've done some things here um, but I think it, it's really important that we all be collaborating nationally um, because there's just so much uh, requirement there so I'm kind of newly aware of that and I'm thankful for that today. Great. And I don't know if Rob's still with you, Michelle, or is he gone? No, unfortunately, Rob and Chris actually, hey, this thing is really happening. They're meeting with another church right now. Uh, they had a meeting already scheduled, and it's going to perhaps be one of the other churches in the pilot. They're trying to find different sorts of, and sizes of, of properties to uh, explore. Um, so they sent their, uh, their thanks for the meeting, and um, unfortunately, they did have to duck out to get, uh, get across town. As, as you know from my, my late arrival, traffic in Toronto is just terrible. If only we could find a, a way to solve that. So, great. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody very much. And um, this call will be posted on Edge's um, website for people to uh, to um, watch. So, if you think this might be of value to other people in your networks, um, please feel free to share that. And uh, we do have more calls coming up. One on community hubs. Um, so that will be uh, coming up soon. And uh, thank you very much. It's been um, very interesting and I appreciate all of your participation and the energy and intelligence and compassion 
and smarts that you're bringing to this whole conversation. So it's been a pleasure. And um, perhaps we can just wave to say goodbye and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks everyone.